Take it away. Okay, round two. So I talked to you about it being sort of an ethical obligation to put this human face on the region and not just talk about death, destruction, and injustice. And I think this is really important. But also for me personally, I had never really thought through the implications of thinking, reading, writing, and talking about people starving to death for a decade of my life. Um, that got really old, you know, because I wanted to do something nice. And I wanted to talk to students about something nice. And I was in the Jesuit archive in, in Beirut, and I found hundreds and hundreds of pages of archives from Kassara, which is still the biggest commercial winery in Lebanon, was founded by Jesuits in the mid 19th century. And I thought, aha, I'm going to sort of balance the famine with, with peace here. So I started looking at the spirit of wine, which I'm happy to talk about now. We can talk about today. If you have questions about wine in Lebanon, happy, happy to look at those. And I was here at the center, and the center's really lucky to have kind of six friends because we can do so much with them. And one thing that we did was fun. Well, we're here. Yeah, exactly. Um, is why we're here today. And we got to bring um, all these really young scholars from everywhere in the world to talk about this like strangely neglected topic, which is the cuisine of the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, which hasn't been the object of a lot of scholarly inquiry. I'm going to try to talk through why that is today. You think about French food. Like we could fill this room with the books written about the history of French food, South Asian food. Um, Mexican food, but you like you can't throw a rock anywhere in the world almost without finding uh, a Mediterranean restaurant, right? And these are coded different ways, which is also interesting to talk through. How do restaurants from Levant code themselves in NY? Where I grew up, it was always Mediterranean, yeah. or sometimes Lebanese and Greek, which meant definitely Palestinians. <laughs> and it's unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, now people are people are. Um, are more comfortable showing off their Palestinian identity publicly uh, everywhere in the United States. So I think that's a, a sign that some things are, are changing, not that everything, of course, has changed. So Annie Gall was really the food studies person. She works on Egypt. She does a lot about gender and class and technology in kitchens in the 20th century. Are you screen sharing? I I'm, meant I'm I'm to share my screen, but I wouldn't put anything past me. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that, friends. Starting out comes. All right, great. So if you're able to book um, any of the food studies person, I really encourage you to check out uh, her work. If these questions resonate with you, we'll talk about recipes at the end. These are ideas about pedagogy that I got from my collaborator and goal. Um, Vicky's the editor here at the center. Um, absolutely transformed this text and made it accessible to a broad audience. Um, and then we had all these different contributors. So we're not the writers of this book. There's lots of different voices contained in it. So why has this topic not received the attention it should? What processes made Levantine cuisine? What can food studies offer your classroom in the Middle East and beyond? So at the end of this session, we'll be able to account for all of these things. Uh, the answer um, to the first one, in my view, is pretty simple. Like, you come into direct conflict with some sort of nationalist narratives immediately when you look into this. So something that's supposed to be very pure, very authentic, very, very stable, starts to unravel really quickly in ways that can be confrontational to exactly the kind of audiences you're trying to cultivate by this line of inquiry. Do you see, do you see, do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. Issues of appropriation get really, the students these days come in with some very firm ideas about appropriation and it's wrong. And uh, it's often me standing in front of a group of diverse students saying appropriation isn't what you think it is. Um, and so I think that's, it's pretty awkward for, for students and scholars, for teachers and scholars to be in that position. So people have avoided a lot, a lot of these questions. What processes made Levantine cuisine? I'll talk about that systematically. And then we'll do an exercise and, and I'll show a recipe and talk about um, a cookbook published in the United States just to try to convince you that you can apply this to any context in questions of race, class, and gender jump out in really complex, interesting ways when we start talking about food. So uh, what does history of food offer our classrooms? Let me, because of the hybrid format, just be thinking about this. I won't put you back. It's 
Should we go back in small groups? Democracy in the classroom here. Let's vote. That's I have a vote. Vote. We're going to stick on. It's just one minute. Of course, it's, it's, a, no, no, it's not. It's, it's, engaged. it's just going to take man. time that will cut away from yeah. what you're doing. Like we can just open discussion, and people have been very responsive that way too online. So, you know, teachers are the best students. So I'm just going to rely on y'all to be thinking about this. I'll get through my presentation and people will have time <laughs> to have a discussion on, on, on the back. Oh, so it, the first modern Arabic language was written by this man, Khalil Sarkis, published in 1885. The title is really interesting, right? <laughs> Who is he writing to? Wow. And this ideology on the front end, when you have the modern people first emerge, it gets implicit later, right? Like the gender politics, but it's just out. Like the gender and class politics are just out. Sure. In, 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 in the front. Oh. And so this is where I started. You know, we can't, how do you know what was really happening in the kitchen if you just have a cookbook, which is prescriptive, how things should be, how people should act. So I try to read these, I tried, we, we tried, our Lebanese collaborator of mine, Michelle Kavalan, and I read these cookbooks um, sort of against the grain of their class in gender projects. And we focused on dish kimpe, which are like dumplings, but they're not dumplings. Meat mixed with grain, with the filling. Um, there's lots of variations that we'll talk about. So we, we found all of the Arabic language cookbooks um, from modern Lebanon, published in modern Lebanon. And Tried to see what uh, we could find. Sarkis was born in the village of Bay in 1840, which is like the capital of the central Medan region, very close to Beirut. He comes to Beirut as a city star, was rising as a cultural and economic capital, and he gets involved with American missionaries and especially the missionary press. In this cookbook, it's sometimes he's clearly copying an American, um, some sort of US cookbook that I have not been able to locate. How do I know that? because he's telling a wife how to cook um, a wild turkey that her husband has killed. <laughs> so like, there's no wild turkeys in the Eastern Mediterranean. That's not a thing. So what's interesting to me is there's like a derivative aspect of this project, right? It's subconsciously derivative. He talks about climbing the ladder of civilization to be like the West. And this is how a woman needs to organize her middle-class home to achieve that, right? So instead of eating on the floor like in villages, you eat at the table, you have discrete um, courses in the meal. You have silverware. So it's like, he's like coaching women through this transition to modernity, but it's also authentically local. So it's like middling in two senses. It's not the old peasant tradition. It's not the old elite tradition. It's something new. And it brings all these food ways from the village into an urban context in Beirut. But this is like Beirut, Jerusalem, Aleppo, this, this like subconsciously middle-class Levantine culture is, is, is taking shape in all of these places around this time in the late 19th century. And so I see this as the birth of Levantine cuisine. There's always sort of a, a class aspirational aspect to this where what the woman, so what does the title suggest? What is the lady, what is her role in food production? Sophisticated European style. She's, yeah, she's sophisticated. Again, oh, exactly. She's not doing the work, she's overseeing servants. <laughs> so it, you, you see something about yes. what's happening in the society, right? You have people who are landlords who own things, who employ people, and then people who are in big um, Again, this is new class formation, and this is a way to to, to, to read. But so there's a not usually when this is happening globally, you're also producing like a moral home but also new national subjects, right? But it's confusing in the 1880s in Beirut because what's the nation in question? When they talk about the food traditions, he writes about sometimes Eastern or Oriental foods, you could translate it like that. And then sometimes he's talking about an unnamed homeland. And then he says, in our Syrian lands, which is vague. The borders of the Levant are not precise but it's clearly, and he says, Syrian, but in the greater sense. So contemporary Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria. And as we read, if you read the chapter, I assigned parts of what's now Southwest Turkey, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that, and so this is why it's kind of, uh, there's a national project here. It's just not attached 
to a specific nation that still exists today. So one of our findings, findings in reading these cookbooks, and this is what I mean is you like kind of run up against immediately some sort of nationalist agenda. There was nothing called Lebanese food before the 1950s. So what was it called? Lebanese food. Sometimes, sometimes he calls it, sometimes he calls it Eastern. Sometimes he calls it Syrian. Okay. Oh. Not, not more like Biladisham. Exactly like Biladisham. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is what he says specifically. So, like, yeah, in these, yeah, in, <laughs> his land of yeah, Syria. yeah, in these, in these Syrian ones, but it's kind of touchy. So, this cookbook stays in print all throughout the French Mandate period. There's no, there's nothing to replace it. People reprint the recipes, but interestingly, in the 30s, in the last reprint, they flip and put the Eastern recipes at the top and then the derivative recipes below. So over time, it kind of becomes more comfortable being itself, if that makes sense. Yeah. I can send you a copy of this. What's the literacy rate in the region? Like, <laughs> like <laughs> but so again, which tells you who this is aimed at. Yeah, right. This is aimed at like a new literate class who's in charge of the foreigners in a city like Beirut and is sort of trying to figure out like the, right, again, how to be modern, but also authentically warm. And, and a lot of these people, so and this applies to, this isn't, um, this class phenomenon is not limited to one sect, but there are a lot of Christians. And so this is important later. Christians have, Eastern Christians have fast days, right? So you have to have- Fast days. Fast days. Oh, fast days. Yeah, so okay. you have to have a meat dish and then a vegetarian component to eat on Fridays or during Lent or other fast days. Oh, and so that's why these Eastern Mediterranean food traditions were very, were very kind of nimble on their feet when the rise of vegetarianism happens in the late 20th century in the West, because it was like, it's very healthy food. And it's also, there's vegetarian alternatives for everything. And what so, sect was Khalil from? He, he was a coverage prostitute, so, and I, and you, and I, and I. So he was a Maronite. Is he born Maronite? I don't know, I, I'm just. Yeah, I'm sorry. He was one of the earliest co converts to Protestant, Protestant. Um, and I assumed he was Greek Orthodox before he was Protestant, okay. but I, I will check. I, I That's that. okay, it's not before. I was kind of curious. No, it, it is interesting, but also because like in this genre of writing at the time, he, you don't, he doesn't, this is not, there's no, there's no, there's, there's no, there's no sectarian words in the book, right? Yeah. It's, not, it's just that you're describing a subject that's like authentically Syrian, yeah, which, again, which I, which I translate as Levantine, but isn't marked by uh, okay. religion except for that um, a, good me a good meal ends with a, dis a hostess displaying a set of bottles of liquor collected from around the world, yeah. right? So I think, which, again, which was not a practice limited to Christian communion, of course, but, but you do get the sense that that is coded Christian, which is also interesting, right? Because some of the Protestant missionaries um, who were there would have been teetotal. So I also wonder about like drinking, like a lot of yeah. these people who are coming from the United States wouldn't have um, yeah. consumed alcohol. So these are the kip editions in Sarkis. One, they, they made one. So that's one of them. Yeah, that's these, and the other thing to look for when you, when you read recipes is like, what does the recipe assume that you know to make these? If that makes sense. Yeah. And so you get more information over time. So basically, like this is cataloging recipes that the author assumes that you already know how to make them. It would be very difficult to pick this up, even understanding all of the Arabic and make one of these if you didn't already know how. Do you see <laughs> what I'm saying? And that changes over time where there's less tacit knowledge um, assumed. A friend of mine uh, who's actually Iranian said, define kibbe as anything you could throw. <laughs> well, you, like, you see all these different kinds of pumpkin kibbeh, potato kibbeh, you can see some of the vegetarian yeah. uh, awesome. alternatives there. It was fat, I mean, in terms of comparing this with the mid 20th century and late 20th century, there was more fat involved in the kibbeh and trade of this. I love And so, Art of in the middle of oh. in the middle of the 20th century, you have the birth of the Lebanese kitchen. And this is connected to some kind of folklore movement who's trying to write about village traditions 
as they're going away. So in the first instance, you have people like Sarkis moving from the village to Henry, and they're trying to capture something, it's slipping away from them, if that makes sense. So that's why when we're talking about food, we're always thinking about authenticity. I think that authenticity is always a fake goal. You can look back through time and see that. It's when these people are no longer in the village or doing something else or embracing this new kind of modern life, they're like, we have to start cataloging how we cooked in the village, which is not something village women would have needed to do, right? They just knew the recipes and they passed them on by word of mouth. So uh, ironic, it's, uh, so George Reyes was the minister of tourism and his name goes on the next cookbook published in Arabic in Lebanon. It's no accident that he's the minister of tourism. It's at that moment that the government of newly independent Lebanon sees that tourism is gonna be a big issue and you need to cook meals the tourists are going to enjoy and that are regular. So this cookbook is about teaching restaurant cooking, if that makes sense. It's strange to read travel literature from the period of like the 50s, because the American travelers always warned like, beware of the local food, you may not like it. So, which is strange, right? Because like, if you want a positive association that somebody had, like the general public has with the Middle East, it's the food. Everybody relies on the food to be delicious and healthy. But apparently um, in the 50s, uh, some of these things were um, unpalatable to American tourists, which again, it's, it's hard for me to imagine. But there's a move on the behalf of the of Lebanese government to codify what Lebanese food is. Americans were eating and each other. And to historicize it. I, and where does Kibbe fit into that? It's interesting because like the food in the village was always very frugal, right? It wouldn't have had a lot of meat. But Kibbe wasn't. And so a lot of like the, when, when you read about the history of Middle Eastern food, we have court cooking, right? We know how people cooked in courts. We know how the elites ate. How did everybody else eat? I think Kibbe is quintessentially Lebanese, which is quintessentially Levantine, excuse me, becomes Lebanese. But before that, you don't find it in Ottoman cookbooks from elsewhere in the empire. What's also interesting is it's it's middling food. It's people people eat That's like if you're if you're in the city yeah. side of it, it's just, mm -hmm. um, travelers there would say you heard you heard people um, banging the kibbe into a paste in every home. So it was like a very already kind of middling tradition that gets imported um, in, in into modern homes. Was there much of a street food kind of tradition? Yeah, there's street food everywhere in like working class food like kebabs, which is something that you read about, also becomes sort of middle class every, everybody's food. But something like a kebab was for to feed a mobile labor force. Okay. So when you have an increasingly mobile working class in the 19th century who's moving seasonally to pick crops like cotton in the Adana region, um, that's where you have sort of the birth of the Adana kebab, which then becomes Turkey's national food. So the argument they made in the chapter that you read is that um, Turkey's national food becomes Levantine, although it's coded as Turkish and not as Armenian or Arab, if that makes sense. Yeah. So we have this process everywhere where something is taken, something is appropriated, and in that act of appropriation, there's like a historical reality that's hidden. Um, in this case, it's not national, it's class-based. Anis Freha wrote, this is a, a picture from a famous folklore text um, called the like the, the Lebanese village, like in danger of extinction. In his village, which he's describing from the early 20th to the 19th century, is always a very harmonious place without any Western influence or class conflict. So what I'm trying to show you is that the modern Lebanese kitchen was born when this new upper middle class emerges in cities and are employing servants to cook food from the village. Right? These extremely time-consuming preparations. Mm -hmm. What's missing from Sarkis is like hummus, tabula, stuff like that. We see at the center of the table today. My sense uh, is that canning, so you can have like tabula needs tomatoes. Lebanon, they eat it year-round. You can preserve tomatoes before modern canning, of course, but it, it's, it's canning and food processors that totally transformed the time necessary to make these things. And that's the birth of restaurant cooking that you have here, for instance. If you make, if, if you, if you make kibbeh in the jun, if, if, if you have to beat it in this huge mortar and pestle, it takes half the day. If you do it in the food processor, it's quiet. 
Same thing with homes. Make homeless in the food processor, suddenly these things become, um, but also profitable to cook in restaurant kitchens. So that's what, that's what I'm interested in. People have, it seems like uh, somebody would have looked at this, but the rise of like the, the Lebanese restaurant, I think has a lot to do with those changes to technology. And suddenly women can recreate these, because uh, of course this labor is gendered, not just women are involved, but it's gendered female. Women can um, do these dishes in a kind of efficient uh, fashion in, in, in their homes. So food helps us look at all of these things. But again, a major finding here is there's nothing called, there's nothing people think of as Lebanese before this mid 20th century period. And suddenly you have more types of kibbe. So what I'm interested in is this, is this huge like modernizing wave in, in the 50s and 60s where everything about this village life chart starts to change even more than it had before. Um, suddenly there's another urge to kind of capture what's being lost and chronicle these different kinds of rural cooking traditions. And then this happens. Did you know Chef Two years ago? People know Chef Ramsey. He was on the he was one that you can find him on YouTube. He was on television during like the good times in Lebanon in, in the early 90s, which was um, another sort of expansion of capital, the demise of traditional rural life. And so what do you know? You have this other as this like traditional life in life in rural Lebanon. This is kind of its, its last hurrah when it becomes very difficult for people to maintain their ability, their livelihoods in, in, in Lebanese villages. And you have Chef Ramsey writing about more kinds of kibbe, which he's associating with specific villages than have ever been chronicled. No. So the problem I'm trying to put my finger on here just to belabor the point is as these things are being lost, people try to capture them in print and in books. So it's always that authenticity kind of slipping out of your, your hands. I'm not blaming these cookbook authors, these male cookbook authors for that. I'm just saying they're part and, and parcel of that process. So uh, uh, are any of you familiar with this book? Mm -hmm. He wrote it with his partner in two senses and collaborator, Sammy Tanini, who's a Palestinian. And we open the book with this, He's walking with Anthony Bourdain to the old city of Jerusalem. And Anthony Bourdain says, you know, who invented hummus? Yeah, I like hummus. Yeah, yeah, hummus. Yeah. 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 get into any of those arguments. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm curious to talk about those arguments, because that's usually what we associate with these, with, with, with these <laughs> foods. Yeah. Yeah. But Otto Linke, who's regarded as the authority, on food from this place, who saw all oh, these Anthony cookbooks, he yeah. tells Bourdain to nobody knows anything about the anything about this history, and he makes some like very basic historical errors. So let me just say that this conversation about food and origin has proceeded um, without a lot of grounding in good scholarship. <laughs> if that makes sense, it's really uh, obvious that falafel and its equivalents in Egypt are. Uh, Indigenous um, to the region. But let me say, I think these uh, battles over appropriation are happening more in the diaspora than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and like, so let me talk about the United States for a second. Like, barbecue is what we associate with the southeastern United States, um, has its origin in some places in the West African tr traditions. Is the bad thing that white people appropriated barbecue? Maybe. But there's some underlying historical realities there um, that were criminal. And like, that's the real wound. Does that make sense? Yes. So hummus. Mm -hmm. This is the problem that Israelis adopted hummus. No, this is a normal thing for humans to do, to take foodstuffs from other places, right? It represents a reality where people's land was taken, right? Where a crime was committed, where people were expelled. So I always try to lead students to the fact of appropriation Let's not die on that hip, if that makes sense. There's a lot of things going wrong here, that, but I think glossing over um, Zionism and uh, the Nakba, like this book does, I think that's the issue with this book as I read it, not an exploration of human culture and food. Oh, for instance, yeah. Like also another example is the Jerusalem salad. Jerusalem salad is salted tahini, the tahini salad, and this is purely 
Jerusalemite. Like Palestinian <laughs> Jerusalemite. Yeah. It's and it's called Israeli salad now. Mm -hmm. And like, I totally understand why that's offensive. But I just think there's a there's a there's an underlying historical reality that that, that the, the crime is deeper than taking the salad and giving it a different name, right? Because these traditions are always in flux, right? People are always taking ideas for different things and calling things different things, and that's just like a very natural and in my view like welcome aspect of cultural and intercultural exchange. Um, it wasn't that was I, was, of, I was, that wouldn't be a problem. I was going to say the same thing, like must be so good that everyone claims it. <laughs> <laughs> That's my attitude because it's the same with the coffee. The Turks say we start, you know, the Arabic coffee, Turkish right. coffee, Armenian coffee. Right? They all do it the same way yeah. with different versions. But well, it must be good. So <laughs> let's eat it and enjoy like that. It. You know, in Turkey you read about. The Turkish state sort of making pistachios not Syrian anymore, but Turkish. yeah, Turkish. Um, yeah, that's not a crime. The Armenian genocide was the crime. Yeah, <laughs> making pistachios Turkish was some, in some sense, a way to cover that up. So, to the extent that it fulfills that this appropriation of foods fulfills the purpose of hiding, um, yeah, and the historical crimes, then uh, we should lament. But, and I, I think this genre of book also misstates the following thing. Mm -hmm. That that kind of cultural diffusion is happening when things are good and intercommunal relations are improving. If you look at the history of Israel and Palestine, in fact, it's the opposite. So, Arab Jews, when they go to Israel, are discriminated against for lots of reasons, including their food, which is thought of as unclean. It doesn't fit the Ashkenazic traditions of the elite in Israel. It's only in the 1990s where this, this Full embrace of Arab food ways as coexistence is becoming um, impossible. In our earlier lectures, uh, we had the discussions about how these communities were living in parts of Anatolia or wherever before they left. And the, the fact, bringing it back to the food, I think those people, the, the Druze, the Armenians, the Turks, or when they were living in the same area, they all ate the same kind of food. And some of the people in the different region, they ate the same kind of food in, in spite of their ethnicity. So I think that kind of like ties up to the fact that it's region, it's the same people, different people eating the same thing. Absolutely. And the differences are region by region. It's several and it's not region. like, yeah. And whatever was available too, I think, areas where they had vegetables and areas yeah. they had grain and they had animals. And there was like a seasonality. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's undermined. And I agree with everything you just said. And when you ask Lebanese people, like, is there like a sectarian kitchen? They'll say no. But then with a the pause, and of course, there are, um, we already talked about vegetarian alternatives for yeah. fast days. Of course, Ramadan everywhere um, has its traditions, yeah. right? Oh, and in, 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 in Jewish populations in these places also had their dietary restrictions in, in, in their own traditions. But people would share across these. The Iraqis would talk about, oh, this is a dish that we learned from our tradition, eat neighbors. Oh. Does anybody have anything else on this chat? I don't know if you have time to, to read this, understand it, or some, some issues with access. But this is my favorite chapter in the book, if you get a chance to read it, because it really stretches what we think about uh, in terms of the Levant um, into what's now Southwest Turkey. It talks about these issues of appropriation in a new, in a different geographical context that's a little less, um, it's less known in the Israel-Palestine issues, uh, I would say. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, I'll just talk through some of these other chapters to see if these might be useful for you or your classroom. Chapter three, the transformation of sugar in Syria is all about how Syria is well known for its sweets. These were elite traditions. And then when you have the mass production of sugar and ice, they become kind of democratized in, in, in the 20th century and for everybody. So again, you have this like element of class just jumping right out. Oh, and then my friend Antonio Tahan, also known as Tony, who was born in Venezuela to uh, immigrants from Aleppo, writes about cooking uh, 
Yeah, he, when he writes it, this is it's the recipe that he gives in there is about cooking Rizbi Halib with his grandmother. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's very much like the Mexican. Uh, 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 what did they call it? The rice with that. You can buy it in the stores, yeah, but it's yeah. kind of the same thing. What is the the Syrian ones, the mahla. I don't recall it. Yeah. What did they call it? Very interested in uh, especially uh, this moment of contact between European Jews and you know. Arabic speakers, Jewish and Muslim and Christian. She does a great job of historicizing that kind of um, encounter, I think, in a new and interesting way. Food is a contact zone between different kinds of people, which doesn't mean that people who sit down together are going to live in peace forever <laughs> and ever. But as we know, and as we talked about in this session, like food from the Middle East is, a, is a, and this is true for lots of immigrant populations, is a key contact zone between immigrant populations. And the rest of society here as well. Chapter six is a, huh? is a standard Palestinian, I would say, nationalist account, um, which is very useful in that regard. And then being Cassis uh, talks about the regional variations in Palestinian food in a really helpful way in a few recipes that she gives there. So we have academic essays paired with uh, recipes in, in particular. And then there's a Gendered labor is what Susan McDougall uh, talks about in a very well written chapter about Amman Jordan and Palestinian uh, women who, who live in Amman. And in Shat Shoka, do you know Shat Shoka? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Just, we were just talking about that. And he, said, no, Siena, he found uh, a cookbook written in Hebrew characters but in Arabic because the Jewish populate, Jewish women in Tunisia could read Arab, couldn't read Hebrew characters for some reason. So would read in, they would read Arabic in Hebrew. Anyway, he translated these Shak sugar recipes, which um, <laughs> appear to originate in, in this community in, in Tunisia. It kind of follows them to, to Israel in an interesting way. And what struck me is that there's a wintertime Shak sugar that doesn't have tomatoes, and then the summertime Shak sugar. Uh -huh. And so he writes both of those, those recipes there, because this is the one dish that Palestinians have appropriated, because now Shak sugar and Sammy Tamimi kind of plays with this Palestinian. The Palestinians have made Shak sugar of Palestinians. <laughs> Had a kind of butter fish and yoga. Tomatoes, it's like a it's free to go up in exchange. What were they using? What were they using? This is this comes from the early you know, flour for the crust and tomatoes for the top, and a few other things that made their way. Yeah. Say nothing of pineapple. Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, we so, have until 12. So, 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 can you really just do a few quotes about how kind of these symbols of the Levant have become totally important yeah. from the yeah. geographical reality? I recommend unmaking the team cuisine, which starts with the team's for and happens more again. It talks about Amsterdam falafel. And it's then, closed now. I know, I know. <laughs> no. We have falafel and eat. And then and, and we finish with a conclusion um, and, and some poetry. But so the activity that I, I would suggest for your classrooms is um, just find a recipe. And you can find almost any recipe and just ask what knowledge they assume, what moral lesson they seek to impart, what sort of thing <laughs> they envision. And when you start thinking about those questions, I think you can get a lot of really um, cool places. But and but we never want to limit ourselves to recipes. Um, and food is a great opportunity to do all histories. And so if you encourage students to just okay. do a history with the oldest person and their family and their family that they can find, ask them how they do so, what kind of technology they used, what kind of spices they used, um, who did the cooking, and, and and that's a way to sort of capture dishes from from from, from the past. So this is the cookbook that I grew up with. It's the, the Joy of Cooking. I'm sorry, it's cut off yes. the top there. Yeah. But it was published over and over. And the Joy of Cooking. She, she, was, she was born in, uh, in 1877, so very much a 19th century figure. Her husband committed suicide in the, after the Great Depression, and she's kind of left with, I need something to do. So she published a, a, a cookbook that later her, her descendants care, carry on. But you get a sense of what they call the zeitgeist here. This is the original version. Modern woman is faced with tasks. 
uh, almost as diverse by the St. Martin's, who's the patron saint of cooking, right? Who <laughs> did some other things in the first paragraph there. So the image of the home she's giving you is a woman who has lots to do, right? This is a modern woman who has lots of responsibilities that may extend outside of taking care of the home. So, and there's, you see, there's like the double shift going on here, right? Where a woman has to work maybe outside the home and inside the home. And this may be challenging. And she's going to give you a whole bunch of recipes to be like a thrifty, effective manager of the house. Which brings me back to the title. It's so interesting, right? Enjoy. But she also must find joy. <laughs> and like maybe all of that on the face is like you get a sense that that may be my mother has a copy of the joy of cooking that she got as a wedding gift in 65 and it has recipes for like dressing squirrels and <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love to compare that one to when i got 95 that's yeah, crazy dressing <laughs> squirrels but for the basics if you didn't learn some kind of basics yeah, you yeah. wouldn't really yeah, get that. and then of course her competitor the bet the mythical betty betty crocker right you know which is similar my mom had that one too it's falling apart in, in my yeah. shelves and so i like just to show students how things changes like nobody would eat that. Nobody would eat this today. And I love you. And I love you. See how it's painted like a middle class household, right? Where you're supposed to go through and find everything that's left over and put it into this big gelatin mass. <laughs> we all do the, you know, like you don't burst something. Sure. Yeah. Just take out the gel yeah, and it's a meal. Changes over over time. Right? Take so out the gelatin and some the rice. Here is is outmoded. Like this is not a technique that we would we, we would use anymore. Um, but also, if you show this to a group of students today, they would say this is like weird white middle American cooking that doesn't exist anymore. It was like specific to to, to that culture. So I think yes. you can find you can find. And then there's a, a descendant the Jello the the colorful Jello <laughs> salads with all sorts of weird oh, yeah. stuff. mini marshmallows and <laughs> purple <laughs> white food. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just I'm curious how you can incorporate recipes and oral histories in your classroom. Let's have a discussion about that with the remaining time before. But so I'm just in North America, restaurants and food venues are likely to be contact zones for people's population from the region and the rest of society. But so I think this is something we need to talk about at the same time that we want to historicize these food traditions. And the tricky thing there is in historicizing them, sometimes we can say things that are like that are um undermines of kind of nationalist understandings of purity and all authenticity and stability in these decisions. And my history of the world in six. I'm not sure how to navigate that problem problematic, but I think it's an interesting question. So like I would hesitate to stand in front of a group of Lebanese students and say Lebanese food doesn't exactly it doesn't really exist. <laughs> we have a question from online if it's time for questions. Sure. Erica, um, and also I, before I go to Erica, um, so I mentions that I believe it's shakshuka is called taktuka in Morocco. Mm -hmm. What she says here in, in the chat. Yeah. Erica? Well, I just wanted to um, narrate or tell about uh, an experience I had with food. I, had, I was teaching at a, a big high school in New York City, Brandeis High School, 2,000 kids, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans. Um, and some other, you know, Caribbean groups. And we were planned a trip to um, Ellis Island. And what I said was, I said, I want everyone to bring something that you cook at home and we'll have a picnic. And so they brought these wonderful dishes from, you know, one of their, the mothers had spent the night, I don't know, <laughs> smashing these things to make these wonderful foods. And we had this wonderful picnic. And um, I didn't do anything academic by trying to talk about contact zones. We just contacted each other by eating this food together <laughs> and then going to into Ellis Island Museum, which we all said, oh, we wish we'd left more time for this. So I thought that was a way to use food in a way that was, um, you no, know, it turned out to be spectacular. It was just, it was just great. It was great. So uh, actually making food that came from each people person's family that were, you know, sort of all in the same um, Caribbean or, you know, uh, Mexican area uh, was was great. It was great for the class. Absolutely. And it brings all these questions to the fore in terms of like, what has changed in the diaspora context? 
like how you can't make things like you would in um, Mexico, or Lebanon, in the same way because you don't have the same ingredients. Mm -hmm. So there's always adaptations that have been made. And those are fun things to tell them about. Oh, the students. Oh, I would also say that for the Arab Americans, this is true. I think it's true otherwise. That even when like successive generations don't know Arabic anymore, the food traditions are much better. So again, it connects people to 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 that to that heritage.